Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I hope you saw part one where I talked about Stephen who was marked by two qualities at least. And one is he had grace, but he also had power. He had a posture of humility and forgiveness, but he also had the oomph of protest and prophetic proclamation. May we have both of these twin towers and not one or the other, right? And so now what I want to do is I want to just, I wrote something. So this is almost going to be like a read, but I'm going to try to read it in a dramatic fashion so you appreciate it because right now I've been listening. I've been listening to what we write. We, we're putting out books. <laughs> we're putting out sermons. We're putting out blogs. We're putting out tweets. We're putting out videos. Everybody's doing something. Everybody's doing another. We're doing albums. And so today I want to, I want to sort of talk in relation to that because you're listening by your likes and your retweets and you're listening one guy went off the rails and he had a thousand likes they liked what he said he had to come back and i commend him because he came back and said sorry i was just hurting <laughs> but everybody had liked what he had to recant he had to repent and recant and he did praise god for him but what about the thousands of people that liked the like him and what he said and the spirit in which he said it. Okay, and you can you can find reason to like anything. Somebody could curse somebody out as a Christian and you can like it. I understand. Okay. So you like when they curse you out. Then somebody will forgive. Yo, man, I just want to say, Father, forgive them. Oh, I like that too. So you like you can't like both. <laughs> You can't like me cursing you out because I'm tired of you and me long suffering with you. Those two are mutually exclusive and forgiving you. You can't like both of those. <laughs> Tell us, well, there's a place for both of those. Well, where in the Bible? <laughs> in the Bible, where? Where's their place? I'm not talking about the Lord Jesus, the righteous one, able to denounce Israel, like denounce the Pharisees. Woe to you, Pharisees, because even his denunciation had tact and poison. Had, had a rhyme and reason. Plus, he was the one without sin, so he could cast the stones. I'm talking about people who think under the guise of the prophetic that they can, they can be harsh and mean. No, 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 no. I think since you're listening, I just want to give you my assessment just so you'll know. <laughs> Whenever we look back, they'll say, where was Ambassador on all of this? Some of you have even hit me. You said, man, I've really been appreciating what angle you've been coming from. And so I'm going to continue to do it. And I'm going to use some thoughts that I wrote down. So forgive me for constantly looking down, but that's what I'm going to do. All right. So first of all, it just seems like there is a, um, a, a, a wave, a wave of intrigue and a wave of interest in the way people, especially the influential people, are leading people through both the difficulties and the complexities of the race issue today. And I understand that because that's that's what's on us. You can't get away from it if you try. If a pastor overlooks the race issues, he will be indicted for being as silent as the church was in, during the civil rights era. And nobody wants to be silent. And the question is, will the sheep during this era be led toward glorious and powerful solutions or will they be left floundering around confused and conflicted because they've heard one person yelling and screaming, fight the power. And they've heard another person is saying we ought to turn the other cheek and they don't know which one and to, to listen to or when you apply which one. Nobody's helping people to understand when should we turn the tables over and with whom and when should we extend like Stephen? Don't hold it against them. I think we too often confuse and conflate harsh, brash, angry, and aggressive rhetoric, an aggressive and a mean-spirited tenor and tone with being prophetic. We say, I'm just speaking truth to power. We need truth. <laughs> we need to speak truth to power. <laughs> we should be indignant. I got a right to be angry. My people were persecuted as though you were. And it's scary to me because I just don't think that we know the difference. We don't know the difference between the prophetic, the spirit-filled, spirit-driven, righteous expression of truth. And when we're flying off the rails, out of pocket, needing to repent because we didn't come with grace and power. We're just coming with being brash and harsh and angry. 
I find that among Christian justice seekers, people, again, we're, we're sympathetic to the overall aims. We're seeking justice. We're trying to get people to understand justice, whether, whether, you know, the biblical justice, social justice, this justice, that justice. I mean, come on. Y'all know what we're talking about when we say justice. This need to be all like precise with the social justice is justice in society. It's not some technical term that the academy has adopted or so you knew what we were talking about. But let's just say, let's just say you want biblical justice or relational righteousness, as uh, Crawford Loritz one time said. He said, come on, man, we're talking about relational righteousness. <laughs> and well, but if you're Christian and you, you're a justice seeker, you're a justice advocate, you talk that justice talk these days, justice preaches, your sermons and your raps are justice filled, the so-called justice warriors, those people, whatever the term is. It seems like that group often is marked by and seems to even prefer mean-spirited combative, combative postures. Seems like they want that over being marked by the grace and the power in Acts 7 when Stephen shows up and he has both grace and power. Seems like when you try to come with the grace and power, when you come with grace and power, people seem there. But when you let them have it, then everybody's like, click, 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 like, like, like. <laughs> Stephen, his face shone like an angel. And as he was being stoned, he said, forgive him, forgive him. And as though it were. And sometimes we say that after all of our rant, we'll say, you know, y'all, we have to forgive. But your posture screams condemnation, even though your lips are saying forgiveness. Your posture, posture and your tone says you are condemned. But then we know, you know, we can't lose our Christian fan base or our Christian consumerism. So we have to say the, the, the spiritual thing to say, but you're forgiven. We got to learn to forgive. But but you're not you're not forgiving. I believe that this power, the right kind of power, is cloaked in grace. And that rhetoric is controlled by that grace. In addition to this contending with gracious composure, which we saw in Stephen, his gracious countenance, which the Bible says was true of Stephen, and those convictions, which the Bible said he was conveying, that was held with compassion. Stephen used good, redemptive, gospel-centered content. And today we're contentious, <laughs> but we're flimsy with the gospel. We're contending with a flimsy gospel or flimsy biblical content. And I'm saying this coming from all the preachers and all the people that like the like all of the, the influential leaders. Sometimes I'm listening. I'm like, yeah, I, I'm on your side. I still think that the way you're using that text is kind of whack. I still believe that the way you're trying to make your argument doesn't hold weight. You're giving them ammo. You got that group over there, the conservatives especially, the people who think they're defending inerrancy, the people who claim to be defending the, 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 the supremacy of the scriptures. And you give them ammo when we, use, when we don't use the Bible or we misuse the Bible. We give them ammo. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm with them. That was whack. I don't think that's what that text is saying. I don't think that's how we use that text. But we don't mind. We don't mind. Hmm. Ex exposition of the biblical text, in fact, is giving way to using text primarily as proof text for valid points we want to make. I mean, in other words, it's, yeah, it's a true statement, but not that text. Right point, wrong text. Rants are too often replacing biblical expositions. That's why we're getting more topical or we're walking through texts of scripture, but we're basically bypassing what the text is meant to teach <laughs> and we're harping on our application of it. We're jumping straight to the application of it and bypassing what the text is actually saying to all God's people for all times. We say it real quick and move on and just drill down on our own contemporary application. And many times that application is off. Now, and I also agree, very few, I can say this, I agree, very few, if any, Christians in our immediate circles are embracing as a totalizing worldview CRT. I agree. By and large, there just happens to be some overlap in our critique 
of both society and some of the systemic issues that we have. CRT will say it. We said, well, we were saying it. And so there's overlap with the critique. Some of the selective insights, you know, in CRT, they mirror some of the points that we say. And again, and then we hear CRT ish advocates and we say, hmm, they said what we say, but I'm not saying it because CRT said it. I'm just saying it because I see it, but CRT sees it. So they said it. <laughs> and so it sounds like people are CRT ish. And then, of course, there are some people who are commending CRT. Um, and again, that's debatable. I don't personally um, say use it. I'm saying I think we need Christians who who show you how the Bible can actually speak to this. Uh, and where there are some points that it makes, we can give credence to it because that way we're telling the world we hear you. And we know that in God's common grace, you too have arrived at similar insights. Go ahead. Give them that. But let's say, but we are the people of God and we use the scriptures. Thus saith the Lord, let every man be, let God be true and every man be a liar. However, it's more common to hear the latest pop literature than a careful treatment of God's word written for all his people as they gather as the new humanity. You'll have Christians get together as the new humanity, but the sermon is primarily talking to us according to the flesh. You know, in 2 Corinthians 5, where he says, therefore, we no longer know each other according we know no one according to the flesh he says we used to think about christ according to his flesh he says we don't any longer i think this is why james didn't call jesus his brother though jesus was his half brother i think james called himself the servant of the lord he's saying i'm not knowing him according to the flesh according to the flesh i was his half brother but according to the new covenant and the new realities i'm his servant james did the same thing he's i'm the brother Jude said, Jude said, I'm the brother of James. They both were Jesus's brother, but they only related themselves as Jesus servant because they weren't dealing with Jesus according to the flesh. I think we have to stop dealing with each other according to the flesh. When we get together as a new humanity, the we is not we as an ethnic group. The we is we as the spiritual body of Christ. When we gather again, it doesn't mean that we ignore the different groups. In Acts chapter 6, we see the Hellenist widows and the Hebrew widows. They were distinguished groups and they had disparities because of their, their socioeconomic, uh, socioethnic realities. However, the solution was, it says, bring the full number. Bring the full number and let's create a solution that will deal with these differences. That's what we need. We need to realize that we're the full number. Speak to the full number of us. And so let me keep going. I get it. I get it. For at least a decade prior to Trayvon Martin, many of us were surrounded by Bible and gospel verbiage galore. All you heard was the Bible. There was a time when all you heard was the Bible. It was in raps. It was in blogs. It was in sermons. It was in vlogs. It was in tweets. It was in posts. It was in curriculum. It was in books. It was on shirts. It was in journals. It was on Bibles. It was on coffee mugs. It was just Bible, 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 the gamut. Bible and gospel talk out the wazoo. And then the current state of things, and some have mar marked it from Trayvon Martin through this era of Trump and beyond. All of a sudden, we started realizing that all that Bible and all that Bible and gospel talk did not seem to equip us or did not show up to be um, as effective in helping us to handle this last what, almost decade of racial and social unrest, we started realizing that, man, that Bible is not being applied in such a way that it would cause us to be able to uh, navigate this moment collectively. So now social commentary critic, social criticism and social science have gained greater support and trust from us. And I get it. I don't agree. That God, God's word, should be the spearhead leading the rest of the tools. The social problems today are certainly many. Let me just say, I am on the side of those who acknowledge systemic racism. I am on the side of those who say that racism shows up more often uh, than people would like to believe. I am on the side of those who say that the social problems today feel exacerbated, feel exaggerated. I don't downplay it. I'm not on that side. Especially given our increased awareness of these things, troubles come so frequently, so fast, so furious that we can't process them. We don't get reprieves from them. 
Injustices continue to plague humanity in general and in America, speaking as a black man, the disparities affecting African Americans, black and brown people even particularly are also burdensome. I see it, I feel it, I know it, even though I find that God seems to prepare a table in this wilderness for me. He allows me to succeed in these times. But overall, when I look at black people in particular, black and brown people even more generally, I do see a disparity. That's the only reason why insurrectionists are not condemned, but protesters are <laughs> by certain people. Come on. Why people who kill people and prove themselves to be a threat go to Burger King on their way to jail. And why people who are not a threat are shot under the guise of, under the, 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 the thought well, I felt threatened. So I do believe that. The increasingly more visible and unapologetic white nationalistic fervor often partnered with cultural Christianity and or political evangelicalism. I distinguish real evangelical from political evangelical, even though some people who I think are real evangelicals are often more political evangelicals than they are genuinely biblical, historic evangelical. However, that makes matters worse. Social media provides us such easy access to these realities. Injustice of every sort now dominates the news cycles, the social media feeds. We live submerged under a deluge of sins and offenses, and everyone is offended, and nobody's ever the offender. <laughs> Who can sustain this? Who can bear up under this? Who can escape this avalanche of hurt? anger, frustration. Some of you, you live in places. It's not you. It's not your people group, so your heart is okay. And it's not you personally, so you're okay. Others of us, we feel the avalanche of hurt and anger and frustration. And this is exacerbated by the instances of racism that do pop up. Even though this is often debated and disputed, it's never racism. People say, I know that there is personal racism, but you never see it. You never see anybody say, now that is an example. The increased tribalism and the hyper-partisanship all oh, just makes matters worse. There's deep division, distrust, depression, dismay. And all this leads to disillusionment and discontent. Overall morale is low. Biblical literacy low. Satisfaction with Jesus in a in Christ identity is low among the people who profess to love their identity in Christ. Love for the church, low. Proper sense of identity, hard to find, especially under the African-American community and even in the church, of course. They want to be some better identity, Loving their ethnic identity, especially if they think that their ethnic identity is a inherently privileged identity. How will we gain clarity and renewed missional zeal amid this convoluted messaging about race, identity, theology, sociology, and ethics? That's my question. How are we going to reset? How are we going to rebound? How are we going to get back to a day where these things are true? You're not going to completely fix them. You're not going to change them in a moment, but you're going to live your life in such a way that your life will constantly be contributing to bringing better solutions and being missional in the midst of this? That's my question. How are we going to get to that place? I've been listening to many of the heralded and hailed influencers and leaders, rappers and pastors, the books and the authors, and I just don't know how we're going to rebound. We don't know how to forgive. We don't even seem willing to forgive. We don't love our enemies. We don't fight hate with love. We don't drive out darkness with light. That sounds so played out so yesterday. Is it me? Am I the only one who thinks this? Yeah, we get reviled. And these days we unapologetically just revile in return. 
<laughs> and then we'll find some socially acceptable reason and way to justify that. Yeah, well, you got to understand. Yeah, well, I understand. Okay. When we are defrauded, we exact payment. We add interest. When we're struck in the face, figuratively or actually, we strike back and say, try Jesus, don't try me because I throw hands. <laughs> when our tunic is taken, we track it down, rip it off the thief and take back what the devil stole. <laughs> If we're asked to go one mile, we stop at a half a mile, if that, and then we say, give me gas money. I mean, you get the point. The things that Jesus says that his people do and should do, we say no. That's how the man uses us to maintain the status quo. What I'm saying is, how will we be the salt and the light, which is the, where that context is, how will we be salt and light in the earth if we are like this? To me, from my limited vantage point, there seems to be somewhat an absent or at least a shortage of gospel. That's gospel climate, gospel sensibilities, gospel reflexes, even gospel preaching. I know we think it's all gospel preaching. It is not. There's almost certainly a lack of gospel centricity because even if the gospel eventually shows up or gospel stuff eventually pops up, it's not central. And it doesn't lead to gospel responses amid all this spiritual warfare. That's what this is. This complexity, this difficulty, this hurt, this pain, you can sum it up under it's spiritual warfare because this is what the devil does. He divides, he especially divides the people of God. So messages that we've been hearing, whether it be in your raps, whether it be in your sermons, whether it be in your books, often from the high profile and influential leaders, they're either helping us right now or they're harming us. Or both. You see what you see what I think. What do you think? This was long, but necessary. May the Lord give us the ability to bring grace with our power for his name's sake. Rally up. Let's go. Let's go. Blessings. <laughs>